Hello and welcome to this video which is about the Tau Reverb 4. So this is the fourth incarnation of Tau Reverb. Yeah, really. And it promises to be a usable reverb with a few interesting features. One of which is the fact that it's free to download. So on screen, you can see the Tau website. The link is in the description. And as you can see from the description, it says it's high quality plate reverb with vintage 80s character. It's got a few features which we're going to take a look at. One of the things which is interesting about Tau's software is the availability. So as you can see on screen, they make it available for Windows, Mac OS and Linux as well. And also it's available in multiple different formats. It's available in VST, VST3, Audio Unit, AAX and Clap. And Clap will probably become more important as time goes by. But once you've got it downloaded, installation is generally straightforward. So the installation is different between Mac and Windows. So on Mac, it's basically download, unzip, and just run through the installer. It's pretty straightforward. I just installed all of the plugin formats. You may want to remove some of them if you're feeling really stingy on space, but generally pretty straightforward. And then you can just run through the rest of the installer with all the defaults. And then you should be good to go on Mac. Now installation on Windows is a little different. So once you've unzipped it, you see multiple different files. Now, one of the nice things about this is there are some software installation instructions. So you can see this, if we open this up in Word, we can see there's instructions in English, which is nice. You can also run any of the three installers for VST3 or for CLAP or for AAX. And usefully as well, you can actually find the individual files. So for instance, if we go in the VST3 folder, once we go a couple of levels deeper, we will see there's a VST3 file, which you can put in the appropriate place, or you can just store it as well. So you've got that saved. Pretty straightforward. So here we are in Cubase, and the first thing you'll notice is it's got a nicely resizable UI. Just grab the bottom corner, drag it to whatever size you like, from micro to uh, massively large. If only everyone's plugins work like this. One day that will be the case. Again, I'm looking at you, Native Instruments. Anyway, let's audition some of the presets and then we'll go through some of the controls. So first things first, often the presets are set with quite a bit of dry uh, in there. So I'm going to turn that off as I audition each preset because it makes sense when you're using it as a send to not have any dry mix in there because then when you change your reverb balance, you're changing the dry mix uh, balance as well. So this is one of my, in quotes, rules. I know there's always times when you break the rules, but generally, you know, if you use a reverb as a send, which most of the time you want to, you want to have it so it's set on wet only because again, most of the time that's how you want it. And then when you change your balance of reverb, you're not changing the balance of your mix. Sermon over. Let's have a listen. So yeah, perfectly nice, perfectly nice little sort of plate reverb kind of thing. We'll get into some of the controls a bit later on. So that's one of the presets. There's not many. So we've got an effects group, long, medium and short. So let's go from short. So let's just go to short. Again, I'm going to whack the mix down. So dry down and wet up. So there you can hear that's a pretty nasty sound in reverb. And again, we'd just bring this level down. I'm going to do it on here. Yeah, you know, particularly with this particular content, you'd want to change the way that sounds. So let's have a listen to it on a different loop. Again, if I mute that, you hear it dry. So because this reverb has got a particular tone to it, etc., it will interact differently with different sounds. So with this loop, it needed to be brought down in level because it was really uh, picking out that kind of harsh resonance in this, whereas that isn't anywhere near as present in this. So it's a bit different. Let's have a quick go on this Tech House drum loop.
again, you know, for, you'd probably want a bit less of that stylistically, but it's nice to have... So we're getting a bit of... I would say we're getting some kind of uh, cancellation effect happening there because when we bring the reverb in, the level's dropping. So this is another thing you'd need to watch, but you probably wouldn't be muting it and unmuting it in the course of a mix. But again, these are all things you'll have to do as you go through and happens with different things. But certainly with this particular one, it looks like we're getting a bit of kind of cancellation happening, you know, phasing over the whole thing and it's bringing the level down. Uh, finally, just this on this hip hop in quotes drum loop. So yeah, a nice little short reverb. So we've got a few others. There's quite a few to go through, and then we're going to look at the uh, actual presets, etc. So let's take a listen to Crystal Clear. Again, on that hip hop drum loop, uh, I'm going to bring the dry mix out. Obviously, unmute it. Now let's take a listen to one of the longer presets in here. So let's crystal clear big, and then we'll listen to dark big as well to get a bit of a comparison between the two. And once again, gonna bring that dry out. And you can hear and still see and still hear that that's that's still going on now so that's a really big uh reverb as you can see it's on the biggest size as diffused as it can be the damping isn't down at minimum and um, we'll look at that but yeah that's a a big a big reverb and because it's got a bit of low cut in there it's not getting too uh sort of muffled and ending up being this big booming thing but you can obviously control that should you wish to so let's have a look at Dark big. And we can see there's some changes in there. The EQ's been changed, etc. Some changes to damping. Once again, I'm just going to bring that mix out and let's have a listen to that. So again, you can hear the difference between the two. This is the kind of thing you definitely want to audition, you know, and certainly it's it's much easier to hear what's going on if you've got headphones on. So finally, in the effects category, there's a few in here, and this is where some of the more unusual controls uh, come to the fore. So for instance, let's take a listen to detuned harmonics. So you can hear there's some tuning things happening in there, which is pretty unusual for reverb. That's not the kind of thing you'd have on your, your standard uh, workaday, everyday reverb, but we will look at what those controls are actually doing uh, a bit later on. And finally, let's have a listen to kick boom here. So here I've just got a kick drum set up on this and I've got this as an insert for routing reasons and just put it plain in there but this is the kind of thing which is often used in a lot of uh, production it's a good starting point for this because you need a big uh, reverb which is going to go on for a while and well let's have a listen And while the sound of that, you know, certainly isn't as crisp as something like some of the presets on a fab filter reverb, 
it's certainly perfectly usable for a free reverb and something I wish I'd had access to a few years ago. So now we've had a listen to some of the presets, let's take a closer look at the controls of the Tower Reverb 4. If you want to learn any effect or synthesizer well, the thing to do really is to try and isolate what each of the controls is doing. Now, in some cases, they are interrelated, as we will see later on. Uh, in other cases, they are reasonably straightforward to understand. But it's definitely a case that if you spend half an hour with a new plugin, just uh, effectively just wiggling the controls and seeing what's happened, most of the time that will get you, you know, that will get you 80% of the way towards learning it because often they will be things which don't interact with other things. There's some, as you'll see later on on this, where unless you set things correctly, they won't work in a particular way. But fortunately for you, I've, I've done the painful part of working out what those controls are. So let's look at the straightforward ones first. So first is size, which should be fairly self-explanatory with most uh, reverb plugins, and it definitely is here. So if we just play this loop, and I change just the size control. So we've turned everything else down other than stereo control for reasons. So we can see we can go from zero size and we're getting almost no reverb right up to 100%, which is obviously insane. So I'm just gonna bring the level of that down to something more tolerable. And we can see that will go on for a long time. We've got no damping, no diffusion. You can hear it repeating as well. So we're just gonna bring that down, but that's, that's your general thing. So obviously size wise, you can hear, if you close your eyes, you can hear the room that you're in, in air quotes, changing. So here you're in a much bigger space, whereas here, much smaller. And again, if I bypass this, you can hear the difference. So another important thing I think to do with reverbs often is to bypass it because it's easy to get in a position where you think, oh, there's no reverb on that. And then when you bypass it, you realize actually suddenly, oh, there is. And often what you're looking for in, I think particularly in quite a lot of electronic mixes that I've done is really subtle reverb that you really wouldn't know was there until you bypass it. But it does help to glue everything together, helps convince your brain that everything's in the same space, etc. And it's not there as an effect that you'd notice and go, ha there's a reverb. It's more of a, a trick to make you think that everything is coherent and, and sits together. So if you bypass it and you, you notice it, but when it's in there normally you don't, I would say often that's what you want to achieve for one of the reverbs, but often you end up with multiple reverbs in a mix. Anyway, uh, the damping control. So this one is just effectively sort of decay how long it takes for the sound to, to fade away. So the higher this is, the quicker it will fade away. So you can hear that's the same size room, but it's like the room's walls are covered with something that just sucks the sounds up. So there you've got hard reflective surfaces here. You've got much softer ones, and to a degree, these interrelate with each other. Delay, this is how far away the, the nearest wall is. So this is the delay between the original sound and the first bit of reverb. So here, with it nearly a second, it's become totally uncoherent, and you can't really work out that it's a reverb. It might be a nice effect if you got it synced to the music. So if we went for sort of half a second, Or maybe even, oh, but we're at 82 BPM, so we'd need to work that out. So you can play around with that. Now diffusion and damping are kind of interrelated. But there you can hear it spreading out a bit more. And stereo, so this is how much, effectively how much stereo is or whether it's panned centrally. So with it on zero, if you're listening on headphones, I think you'll notice this more. So now the reverb is right down the middle of the stereo field. 
Whereas if we go to 100%, the left and right channels are slightly different. Now the dry and wet controls uh, we've already covered. They're fairly straightforward. It's say most of the time you'll probably want your dry to be zero because otherwise you'll get what I mentioned before. And the wet control, certainly it's easy to end up with distortion. So if we go much above this, we'll end up with distortion. So this probably needs to be lower than you might think, depending on your reverb settings, etc. Now let's take a look at the potentially more interesting and unusual bits. We're gonna start from the right hand side because these are the simpler parts. So lo-fi, we've just got a, a bit crusher here, which is a useful thing to have because you can make it sound like some trashy piece of uh, gear from the 80s and 90s. As we bring this down, you'll hear the reverb sound will start to become much more noticeably degraded. So I'm just gonna make that a bit more noticeable. And as I bring down the bit depth, you can hear some noises creeping in because we're getting quantization noise in this, but also it will start to sound much more. Yeah, so here, Again, not sure, depending on your listening environment, that may not be so easy to hear, but on headphones, that's really clear. You can hear that low level noise in there. And as we bring it down more, it will just get worse and worse. So four bits, it now sounds distorted because that's the way that bit crushers work. Three, even worse. And it almost sounds like it's got distortion in the gate on there. Yeah, and because of the low level of our signal, we're not getting that much. If I bring that up more, you can hear now it's breaking through those two bits more often and we're getting that distortion level coming through. Now, the other thing is the sample rate. That's what SR stands for. And if I bring that down, the effect of this becomes more apparent. So these two interrelate with each other to a degree. So it will become more apparent that we've got As I bring this sample rate down, you can hear the reverb sound is becoming uh, lower in frequencies, etc. So we're, we're losing the top end because this means we're cutting off. So playing around with that, it's the kind of thing you want to do in a quiet environment so you can hear what's going on, but that's quite nice to be able to have that. Now the EQ. Again, this is another thing you can do with a channel, obviously, it's fairly straightforward to do that, but having low cut on an EQ, particularly if you're going to save a preset, is, is useful. So we can cut the bottom end out. So at the moment, if you listen to the, the reverb on the bass drum, maybe you don't want so much reverb on the bass drum. You know, the old thing back in the day was you wanted less reverb on things such as basses and bass drums because they tended to just muddy everything up, but we can EQ some of that out. So now that hasn't got that sort of muddy boominess to it. And we can go further. We can go too far. But you can imagine playing around with that is quite useful. And also we can change the top end so we can bring high cut down so we can change effectively change the tone of the reverb. Make it a really dark sound and reverb, etc. So although these are these are only simple controls, they give you quite a bit of creative uh, freedom with it. And we've also got a peak EQ. So here we've got two controls. You've got the frequency and the the gain. And the gain for this is 36 dB. So it, it gives you quite a bit of uh, creative power here. So let's just do something uh, silly. Let's find the frequency of are kind of clicky snare sound. So to do this, whack it up a reasonable amount, always be careful with your listening levels, and then try and find that. So that's the kind of thing I'm after. And now what we're gonna do is remove that a bit by bringing that down. So it's not dominating that as much. And now you can hear the reverb on the bass much more because the 
side sticky kind of snare sound isn't dominating that reverb sound because we've taken that out. So again, you've got quite a bit of creative control. Another nice touch. If you double click the gain control, it goes back to zero. So that allows you to reset that. Now, the final four controls, this is where it gets a bit wacky, shall we say. So we've got uh, modulation and tuning, which is pretty unusual for reverb. So modulation, effectively, we've got kind of a chorus effect here. And this allows you to thicken things up and create some interesting tonality in here. So you've got a rate control, which is in percent, and you've got an amount, which is in percent. So that you just need to sort of keep your wits about you on this because they're both scaled the same way. Let's just put the amount to 50%. And you may be able to hear that. And if I bring this up, let's bring the amount up more. Now again, you can hear that modulating the reverb sound. Now, if we really want to hear it, what I'm going to do is to take this send and I'm going to put it on pre. And then I'm going to bring the dry level down. So we're only going to hear the reverb sound. So although that's quiet, I'm going to then bring this up. So you can hear what's going on a bit more clearly. So now you should hopefully hear that. So you can hear that being modulated, the pitch of that. So if I put it on zero, Staying pretty constant. If I you can hopefully hear the, the pitch. If you listen to the pitch of the reverb on the, the snare sound in particular, you can hear that moving around. And you can play around with the combination of these two. Now, let's now look at the tune control. So I'm just going to bring this down to zero. So now this is doing nothing. And again, I'm going to bring this into 100% so we hear this really clearly. Now, as we change this, so we can hear we've got a, a fixed pitch control here, so we can tune the reverb signal by up to an octave. And then as we bring that back in, so you can hear that's a slightly weird sound. So that's probably There are some presets in here which use uh, octaves in there, so we can only go up an octave, etc. There's some times when I think that works. It's probably not the most useful control in there, but it's it's interesting to have that as an option. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is the side chaining. So side chaining is something you often end up doing on reverbs to effectively move the reverb signal out of the way of whatever else is happening in your mix. But it's it's interesting to have this built into this reverb because it gives you the ability to do it potentially without complicated signal routing and also to have it built into presets, etc. that kind of thing. So, so we've got two controls here. The first one you want to start playing around with is the docking control. So this is how much that the reverb level will get turned down by the signal that's passing through the reverb. So in other words, if you get a loud hit coming through, it will turn the reverb sound down. That works reasonably well and gives you a sound you've probably heard uh, before. So we're just going to play it on this hip hop loop again. And then I'm going to turn the ducking control up. So I've just got this on the drum ambience preset, which I've just set just to be wet. So we get the idea. So there we get the idea of what the reverb is. If I turn the reverb off, you get the idea there. And this ducking control effectively allows us to turn this control down automatically. So the louder the input signal is, the more this gets turned down. So if I turn this up, so 
So you can hear when, particularly when the bass drum comes through, we can see how much ducking is happening. And you can hear that you're getting that kind of compressed sound. It's almost like a side chain kick drum kind of effect that you get where you've got the kick drum side chaining, you know, a synth sound or a bass, etc. So it's the same kind of thing. It's just being done all in one here. So that's probably too much, but a bit of it can help clear your mix out. And it's just automatically doing something that otherwise you'd either not bother to do or would take you a long time to do. But it's also possible to externally sidechain this. So if you turn on external sidechain, uh, then you need to set this up. So in Keybase, you set this up in the way that I'm going to show you. But obviously, if you're in a different DAW, then you'd need to do it differently. So what we're going to do is we're going to leave the reverb on this, but we're going to have it sidechained off of this big percussive hit here. So I've got this big percussive hit, again, just from Media Bay. And that is going to turn the reverb down on this. So the way that we'll set this up is we click the cog here and then we need to add our sidechain source. So click that there and then I'm going to pick our percussive hit. And I'm going to put it onto pre because that means I can turn its level down in the mix, but it will still have a significant effect there. The other thing you need to do is make sure you turn this on. So now what's happening is the signal from this is being sent into this side chain. And we can see that at work even before we listen to its effect. You can see that, that when the percussive hit happens, this comes down. And let's just turn that up so it's pretty severe. And because I've got this on a pre-fade ascend, even if I turn it down so we don't hear it in the mix, you can see that effect is still happening there. So that signal's getting through no matter what. Obviously, if we mute the track, that won't be the case, but we're just gonna put it so we get some of it through. And then if I now... So you can hopefully hear the reverb is fading out. And then it's coming back in once this So this gives you a bit more flexibility in terms of the way that your reverb is being sidechained by having this external sidechain, which you can send all sorts of signals to it. So you could do the, you know, the same old thing of having your kick drum. So your kick drum would be bringing that down, etc. There's There's lots and lots of opportunities. Sidechaining and volume automation is really good for creating mixes where there's just subtle movement in things which otherwise you'd either take ages doing or more likely you probably wouldn't end up doing yourself and it also means it happens automatically so if you change something in your mix if you put the hit somewhere else it all gets done for you so this is this is really useful Different plugin manufacturers handle automation in uh, quite different ways. Tau's plugins generally have been pretty good historically. It's one of the reasons why I first downloaded Tau Filter back in the day because it was the first free low pass filter plugin which automated really well, which was important as I was working in a lot of schools who didn't have any budget and wanted to make uh, dance music with lots of filtering, etc. So that was my first introduction to using them and this follows in pretty much the same tradition. It follows well in terms of automation and doesn't do anything crazy. Here's an example of something which on some plugins wouldn't work particularly well. And on here, I think because the controls are smoothed out nicely, it means you can do something creative. So here I've just got a reverb set up on this drum loop. And a byproduct of changing the size is that the uh, effective pitch of the reverb changes. And you can just automate this pretty easy. So if I just go back to the beginning, turn right on, and then I'm just going to change this size and you'll hear it work, but it works smoothly and works nicely. It's the kind of thing you could, you could play around with and just put in the back of a mix just to put a bit of interest in there.
not all plugins handle that kind of thing easily. Also, when we look at the plugin in terms of what's available, we can see everything's labeled sensibly. It's all going to work nicely, etc. That, again, isn't the case with all free plugins for sure. So it's nice that this much attention has been paid to these kind of things, which sometimes end up just with numbers. Occasionally you get a plugin where it's just bypass. That's the only thing you get. But here we have everything, which is great. Final thing, uh, preset management, etc. So we can save something. So let's say I've played around with this and I'm happy. So I'm just going to call it dr drum ambience sidechain. We save it in a folder. It's all folder based, which is quite useful. And then that appears in there. Another nice thing is we've got undo and redo. So this is something which I really like on plugins. You don't see it on all of them, but I, I wish everyone would just implement this because it's just so nice to go, oh, you know what? I've just played around with three controls and I want to go back and I can just go back, you see, or I can go forward. Works really nicely. Even having one step undo is nice, but this is multi-step, which is really nice. Uh, here we can look in the presets which are present here and we can see we've got different banks etc and this is done here so if we make a new bank let's just call it let's learn how to use a mac let's just call it custom And you can see as soon as you put something in a new folder, you get a new category. So that's how you can categorize them. You can also star them if you want. So let's, you think that's the best thing ever. Then we can filter them pretty easy. We can filter them via that, etc. It's nice to be able to have some reasonable preset management in there. So you can search for any text, etc., that kind of thing. So this works reasonably nicely. It's not, you know, a, a massively complicated thing like Media Bay, but it's quite nice to be able to do that. And if you organize things sensibly in your folders and name them sensibly, you'll be able to find pretty much anything you want. Although I'm not sure you'll necessarily end up with 50,000 different presets for this. So that's the latest update for the Tau Reverb plugin. So this is Tau Reverb 4. It's free. The link is in the description. Again, it's not the world's greatest reverb necessarily, but it is quite nice and useful. It's nice to have something that's tunable. It's nice to have something which has a nice, easy interface on it. And also it's good to have something which has got a couple of wacky controls in there. So the modern tune sections, you know, they're not necessarily uh, something that I'll be using every day, but occasionally you want something a bit different and a bit fatter or with a weird tuning in it in that reverb. And it saves you having to do it via other means, i.e. adding something into your channel after the reverb plugin itself. And it means you can save it as a preset. The side chaining is really nice, having that ready to go. And again, having that in preset form is just useful. So you can just load it up and make your sessions much more about creation rather than spending time routing signals and worrying about this, that, and the other. And obviously the price is always perfect. Tao's other plugins are worth looking at, both the free and paid ones, uh, but hopefully you will get time to feature them. But as you can see, even on a reverb, it can take a while to go through all the features. So going through all the features of Tao Sampler would be uh, many hours of content. As ever, hope you found that useful. And if you have, we'll see you again soon for more Music Tech Tuition.